our call to worship this morning is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one, no one may boast. And uh, we thank the Lord for his wonderful grace and mercy to us. Let's sing together. 258, 258 in your hymnal, there is a fountain. <clears throat> there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains the dying thief rejoice to see in his day and there may I though vile as he wash all my sins away wash all my sins away wash all my sins away shall never lose its power all the ransom church of god be saved to sin no more be saved to sin no more be saved to sin to sin no more ere sins by faith I saw the stream clean wounds supply redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die and shall be till Number 250, 250, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. my 
I smitten heart with tears to wonders I confess the wonders of redeeming love and my unworthiness I take across thy shadow for my abiding place I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of his face content to let the world go by to know no gain nor loss my sinful self my only shame my glory all the cross amen 247 as we keep our thoughts on the cross 247 the old rugged cross <clears throat> special music just then and you did a fine job uh, 355 as we get ready for the table on the first verse kids are dismissed downstairs for junior church 355 let's stand as we sing Jesus paid it all I hear the Savior 
If you would turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. I kid about being the worst speaker at the conference. I might be. But it doesn't bother me if I am. I'll do my best. And um, God will be pleased and it will be God's word and it will help people in the heart. That's what it does. Um, the um, fact is it's, it's nerve-wracking to preach to preachers. That's what makes it really kind of hard. It reminds me of one of my dad's standby jokes, and that was uh, two cows are up on a Pennsylvania hillside, and uh, they watch the milk truck go by, and it says Valley Farms, you know, milk. Grade A, pasteurized, homogenized, vitamins A and D added. The one cow looks at the other one and says, Bessie, kind of makes you feel inadequate, don't it? <laughs> well, that's how I feel preaching to preachers, a little bit inadequate. Um, it's also hard because, sadly, uh, my subject matter, faith is the only prerequisite to salvation. That's my title. That's my subject matter. Uh, that's a little bit on hard times because people sometimes put such an emphasis on repentance that they get the idea that repentance precedes faith. Well, repentance is a, is a change of your way of thinking. If you're going to change something, wouldn't it stand to reason you need to be alive to change it? But before we know Christ, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We're, we have a pulse. We're, you know, physically, thumpity thump, we're alive. But spiritually, we're dead. The Bible says, you has he quickened who are dead in your trespasses and sin. He, that is, he's made me alive. He gave me new life when I was dead in my sin. Do you know what a dead man can do for himself? Absolutely nothing. He can't do anything for himself. So God works in me. Our call to worship this morning, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved. Grace, period. God starts it. His grace. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is God giving me something I didn't earn, and I sure don't deserve. That's grace. 
For by grace are you saved, delivered from your sins, eternally saved, and that by faith, and that not of yourselves, that is, it doesn't start with you, you don't empower it. It's a gift of God that you believe, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's very different from a lot of theological or church systems that teach a good works-based salvation. You need to be good enough, long enough, and refrain from being bad enough, long enough, that maybe, hopefully, you get to heaven. That's a great way to get people, theoretically, it's a great way to get people to do good things, but it is not at all what the Bible teaches. The New Testament is replete with verses that tell us salvation is by grace and faith. What God requires of us is faith. And so, as I have been pondering this conference sermon that's been hanging over me, uh, it's funny because I volunteered for it, but it's been almost two years ago where I was at the council meeting where they were setting up the who was preaching what, and they said, it's your turn, and seeing as I was there, I jumped at this one. There's a lot of good subjects, but this is what I wanted. Now I wonder what I was thinking. Uh, but uh, I have had, since COVID, I've had an extra year and a half to think about what I'm going to say. So theoretically, it should be better that way, right? In theory. Um, but you know, it's been so good for me to stop and to read the basic passages about my salvation and to be reminded. And as I, as I pondered it, I thought, you know, that's really where we ought to spend our time this morning. Maybe as it has encouraged me, it will encourage you. Maybe you're here and you have not made it your own as yet. You haven't trusted Christ and Christ alone and his finished work on Calvary for your eternal salvation from sin, uh, maybe it's not all that new to you and you need to hear it. Uh, one of the most dangerous things that can happen behind that pretty pulpit is for the preacher to, to make an assumption or a presumption that people know a thing and not to put it out there and to preach it and teach it. We need God's word, we need every last bit of it. It's all profitable, especially those passages that show us how to be right with God and how to know. These things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. Uh, John gives the whole purpose of his gospel. He says, many other things did Jesus, truly did Jesus in the time he was on earth, but these that couldn't be written, the books wouldn't have enough room, but these were written that you would believe and that believing you would have life in his name. Scripture is full, the New Testament is full of the call to salvation by faith. Believe, believe, believe. That is the call to salvation. Trust in the Lord. And so let's take a moment, let's look in Romans chapter 3 together uh, at the end of this wonderful chapter of Scripture uh, that talks to us about our salvation. Verse 21 of Romans 3, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised, or the Israelites, those practicing Judaism, by faith, and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. Paul says elsewhere that the law was our schoolmaster, our tutor, to bring us to Christ. Nobody was ever made righteous by the Old Testament law. Nobody was ever made sinless by the Old Testament law. Do you know what the law did? It showed us our guilt. 
God wrote down in exhaustive fashion. We, we talked about it not long ago, and we'll talk about it again in our First Corinthians study. The Old Testament, there is this exhaustive list of all the people that you're not to know in a sexual manner. And so it, it talks about your, you know, your in-laws and your stepchildren and your nieces and nephews and grandchildren. And it gives this exhaustive list, your neighbor and, and the person that your neighbor owns and all of these things. It gives this exhaustive list. In the New Testament, what does it say? Fellas, your wife, everybody else in the world, everything else in the world is off, out of bounds and you can't go there. Have that relationship with your wife. It's precious. Develop it. Cherish it. Don't ever, ever, ever go outside of it. That's how the New Testament puts it. What is the Old Testament? It gives us this thorough law. There's, there's nowhere to get around it. It's spelled out. And what does the Old Testament tell us? It tells us we can't keep the law. Maybe that's not the area you trip, but the law keeps going. And it talks about honesty and on and on and on. And there are all these things that nobody ever kept it perfectly. And so the law showed us that we couldn't keep it. Nobody ever. Wonderful people tried and failed and failed miserably because we're human. And that's what we do. It was beyond us, and that showed us the need of Jesus Christ. If we spend time in the Old Testament, if we spend time in the law, we realize our deficiencies. We realize that we're not up for it. We can't live well enough to please God, and we realize this. And so in the first three chapters of Romans, Paul is talking about the people who never had the Bible, who never had a religious system, who didn't have the, the Word of God given to them, they can see God in nature and they refuse to see God in nature, to see Him in His creation all around us. And not only that, but they worship and serve the creature more than the Creator. So they worship the world and not the God who made the world. I've often thought how silly that people worship a, a God that looks like a man that's been carved or chiseled out of wood or rock by a man. That's no God at all. I love the story of, of a young man that was in a, in a remote, remote tribe in the South Pacific on, a, on an island, and they worshiped a little tiki god, a little wooden idol. This man was an idol maker's son. His dad, his granddad, his great granddad, they'd all carved this idol. It's what they did that was their life's work. And so he inherited the family business or would someday, and he found that he thought it was a little silly, and he was threatened and, and, and warned that, you know, terrible things would happen to him if he ever made the idol less than perfect. And he got thinking that that was silly, that that was an inanimate object, that he knew where it came from. He cut down the tree. And so <clears throat> he started to monkey with it and made one ear a little too low, made the nose a little too long, made the eyes a completely different shape. You know what happened to him? Absolutely nothing. And so he starts to doubt the power of this God that he is making with his own hand. And even as he's doing this, the Lord puts it on his heart to look at the tree. And he thinks about all that has to go into that tree growing and the orderly nature of its growth and the rings that tell you how old that tree is and the beauty and how the most beautiful wood is where it has to grow around an imperfection, a stone or something else in it. Uh, it's a pretty amazing thing. I remember my dad cut down a tree at our house when I was a little kid. It was a walnut tree, and uh, he made a cut through it, and here it was, and it was shaped kind of like a heart, and when he sh cut a cross section, it really looked almost like a heart, and where the indentation was, there was just an old walnut there. He cut it in half with the saw, and it, it kind of looked like owl's eyes, I always thought, uh, but he put that on the wall because it, you know, it tickled him and uh, left it there for all of us to see. Uh, I love burl, and burl is just where there's a stone or some other contaminant, and the wood grows around it, and it's beautiful that way. And so this young man, he started to see that the tree was made by someone or something with a plan, and that it was a beautiful thing. That didn't save him, but you know, when the first missionary came to his town, you know who the first convert was? The first person to believe in Jesus Christ was that idol maker's son. God had him ripe and ready, and he was right there. And when the missionaries left and the church called its first pastor, it was the idol maker's son. We can see God in nature, and if we refuse to, we can't get to him. And then there's the moralist. The moralist makes up his or her own rules and sets their own. And then, and we see this around all the time in our world, even in our country, 
people set their own standards and that they don't keep their own standards. That's, that's universally true. Even when people make up their own laws, their own rules, they don't keep them. And then lastly, he talks about the Jew, and the Jew, uh, the practicer of Judaism, has God's Old Testament law given to them. They know exactly what right is. They know exactly what wrong is. They have everything written down that God needs them to know, and they still don't keep the law. And so he summarizes in verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of us attains heaven by our works. It cannot be done, period. And so he goes on from there. Verse 24, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation or a atonement, a sin payment in his blood through faith. You see, the law tells us we can't keep it. And, and Paul has, has developed this and said that whether you make up the law or whether you have God's law in the Old Testament, all it does is prove to you that you can't keep it and you need something outside of yourself. And so God sent Jesus to die in our place, justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. This, if move into the middle of verse 25, this was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You, if you've listened to me very long at all, you know I love verse 26. We, we think of God's love. There, there's a lot of emphasis in greater American Christendom and in churches today. God is a God of love, 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 love. We, we center on that, and all the churches around us, no matter what they believe or don't believe, it's all about love. God is perfect love. He's the embodiment of it. He's the basis. We, we know what love is because we know we see it out of God and who he is. But God is also perfectly just. He believes in, he embodies perfect justice. Justice says right must be rewarded and wrong must be punished. Perfect justice says, Romans 6, verse 23, the wages of sin, the justice that comes from sin, is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what we deserve is a Christless eternity in hell because of our own personal sin. We have all fallen short of the glory of God, and God ordained to send Jesus Christ to die in our place and pay the price for us, and what he requires of us here in Romans 3 and John 3 and so many other places is merely that we believe. Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth. Jesus, the Son of God, lived on this earth some 33 years, and at the end of that time, in a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, he went to Calvary's cross and he died. One person, the God-man, Jesus Christ, died for all people, for all time. And what is required of us is that we believe that Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth, died on Calvary's cross for my sin, and that he three days later rose in victory over sin, over death, and over the grave. That's where salvation comes from. Acts 16, verse 31 boils it right down. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. What we're doing with our conference is we're preaching through the, the statement of faith of our New England Fellowship. And I get to the statement of faith as it regards salvation, and there is a wonderful one-sentence paragraph, and it has one verse as proof. We believe that faith is the only prerequisite of salvation, period. Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And so there it is. And so there's the gospel. Uh, turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians in chapter 11. Try to weave these together and show our context for our discussion of salvation. Well, that's why. If you ever have caught me, I have two Bibles at communion time. I have two Bibles at communion time because I always go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 
and I've long since memorized it or mostly memorized it in King James, and if I try to read it in something else, I trip. And so um, 1 Corinthians 11, first, the end of 1 Corinthians 15, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to the end, those are things I use often, and I almost always read them out of the King James because I get tripped up if I don't. Uh, it's how my head works. Um, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, Paul writes to the Corinthians, explaining communion to them, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. And so first and foremost, we talk about what we're doing here today. What we're doing here today is a memorial service. This is not a mass. The body and blood of Jesus is not present in front of me. It does not become the body and blood of Jesus as you ingest, us, as you ingest it. Uh, ponder that a little bit and tell me how that idea is different than cannibalism. Uh, this is not a re-crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us clearly, died once for all, the just for the unjust. Once for all. He need not be crucified again. He could not be crucified again. To say anything like that would diminish the power of what he did. He died on Calvary's Christ once and for all. And so we come together to obey him. And what does he tell us? This do as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Why am I doing this? I am doing this to remember Jesus Christ, my Savior, and that he died on Calvary's cross for me. He gave us these simple elements. This was at the end of the Passover meal. The Passover meal in included everything that was eaten there. If, if you ever have the ability, uh, I did once at a, at a pastor's conference, there was a pastor there who grew up Jewish uh, in, a, in a very uh, conservative, practicing Jewish household. And so he taught us, he, he led us through the Seder meal. Uh, the pastor's wife who cooked the meal that evening cooked the, the, pa the traditional Passover feast for us. It was really a treat. I, I've told you often about uh, my friends. One of them is Sean Callan, who preaches Friday morning, uh, a big red-headed Irish cop turned preacher. And uh, he took a big bite of the horseradish that was part of that meal. And you could see his neck and his ears were kind of like a thermometer. It just went red right up. It was really something else. Uh, but the bitter herbs the horseradish, the meat, the unleavened bread, everything was significant. And there were several commemorative cups where the, the drink was passed round and they drank to commemorate what was done. And so at the end of that meal, Jesus bro broke bread again and he gave it a new significance. This bread is my body, which is given for you. This bread represents my body, which is given for you. This cup, this as commemorative cup that we drink, is my blood, which is shed for you. This is the New Testament in my blood. So they were simple elements. They were at the table. They were commemorative elements. That was what that meal was about. That meal was not about thanksgiving and stuffing myself to the gills. That meal was about remembering the Passover that got the Israelites out of Egypt where the death angel came as the 10th and final plague and finally Pharaoh and company said, take them away, get the Israelites out of here and God's people were finally let go. And those who took the Passover lamb and spread the blood on the doorpost, the, Passover, the angel passed over, hence the name Passover. And so these elements were at the table, they were commemorative, here they are again and they're commemorative. We are to remember what Jesus did. God knew. He knew we were simple people. And we needed a simple remembrance. They used unleavened bread. Probably a torn apart pita pocket would be about the best you and I could do to be just as exact to that as we could. Uh, we typically use a cracker. And in the last couple of years, we've gone to gluten-free uh, so that folk are okay with that and nobody has to worry about it. Uh, and we're grateful to homemade to folks who make homemade uh, crackers for us to do that. 
but everything we do here is in remembrance of Jesus Christ and what he did for us. That is our purpose. It is a memorial. He knew we needed simple elements. He also knew we would get too busy. We would get too distracted. We would live too selfishly. And we would quickly and easily forget the price that was paid for our freedom from sin and our deliverance from an eternity in hell. And so simple elements to remind us to focus our thoughts upon the cross. We've kind of typically been doing our announcements and prayer uh, at the beginning of every service because we've been going to YouTube. But even before that, we, we do the housekeeping type of things, the announcements and such. We get those out of the way and we don't interrupt. And the whole song service is about the cross and about our Savior. The goal of everything that we do in the service is to focus our minds upon the table and by the table to focus our minds upon the cross and to stop and to remember what Jesus did for us. And so the first thing is it's a memorial. He goes on, verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. We started in Romans chapter 3, we started with the discussion of the gospel. Where this ties in is right here. We're to come in a worthy manner. That really has two major ideas to it. The very first of which is that we need to know Jesus Christ personally as our Lord and as our Savior. We need to be trusting in Him and Him alone for our salvation eternally and from sin. Jesus and Jesus only. Jesus says, He is the way, the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Peter says, There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Are you trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, believing that He, the Son of God, came, that He died on Calvary's cross? and that he rose three days later in victory. If you are not 100% certain about those things, if you are not trusting in those things and only those things for your salvation, please let the elements pass. Quiet little wave. Deacons will keep walking. The world will not stop. Nobody will stare. Please, please, please let it go by. If you're not sure of your salvation, please just let it go by. It's a serious thing. He says, he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation or condemnation to himself. And so the first thing about worthy is knowing Christ as our Savior. Secondly, it's having no known and unconfessed sin. I give it that proviso because you and I, well, our ability to sin outstrips our ability to remember our sins. Uh, we're, we're quicker at sinning than we are remembering everything. Uh, And there are things that we do in ignorance. We might not even know that there is sin. I've had people come to me after I preached a passage and say to me, Pastor, I never knew. All my life I've done that. I never had any idea God said not to. And so we come and to the best of our ability, we confess, 1 John 1, 9, we own up to a thing. And if we confess our sin, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so coming in a worthy manner, I know Jesus is my Savior, and to the best of my ability, claiming only his wonderful promise that if I confess it, he'll forgive it, my heart is right before him. Toward that end, let's take a couple moments for silent prayer.
Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is for you, this do in remembrance of me.
After the same manner also, he took the cup. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we're grateful for today. But Lord, we can come before you, Lord, knowing that you have called us out of the world, Lord, and given us the opportunity to uh, come come to your throne, Lord, and to know that one day you will be with you forevermore. So, Father, you have sent your only begotten Son into this world, Lord, to die for our sins. Lord, we can only uh, praise you for that. Lord, we can uh, ask and pray, Lord, that not just this moment, not just this hour, but each and every moment of the day, each and every moment of the week, Lord, that we would remember the great thought that was given that day on Calvary. Lord, we pray ask again that as we go into the world, Lord, that we would seek out those that are lost and Lord, those that are dying. Lord, help us to um, spread the good news of the greatest gift that was given to all mankind. We ask, Lord, as
He took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Typically, we collect our deacons' fund offering at this time. Is there a plate? There's a plate in the entryway for that. Uh, if you have a check that's marked, that dares to go in the um, box. Some have already done that, but if giving cash or otherwise, uh, there's a plate there for the deacons' fund. The deacons' fund is our benevolent o- benevolence offering. Folks give as they're led of the Lord uh, so that we can help one another out, uh, most of it right in the family and the church family. Uh, when folks have a need, uh, heating oil, groceries, etc., uh, we help one another, car repairs, and um, once in a while we have people outside the church that come to us from help, and that's where we help them from as well. And we commend you and thank you. It's, it's been an absolute delight. God's people have been so faithful uh, through the years with that. Um, Kareth, I'm going to skip the closing hymn. I'm going to have, have prayer, and then we'll do Worthy as the Lamb as I scoot. Uh, Hector, would you close in prayer for us? Would you stand together with me as we sing, Worthy is the Lamb.